So next up we have Shelley Rayback. Um, Shelley is an associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Vermont. She's a dendrochronologist with interest in Arctic and Alpine environments as well as the Northern Forest. She uses dendrochronological and stable isotope techniques to understand shrub and tree response to past environmental change. And her talk is the tree ring perspective, how dendrochronological techniques enhance study of environmental change in New England. Um, I'm going to stay behind the mic because I don't think my voice can carry very far today. Um, I first want to thank my co-authors uh, today because they have allowed me in some cases to use some of their data, so I appreciate them being very generous about that. Um, my emphasis today is really to raise awareness of dendrochronology. Some of you are just preaching to the choir. Others are trying to generate some more interest in the hopes of some collaborative relationships in the near future. So the... Let's see, uh, what I'd first like to do is just provide you a roadmap, uh, roadmap of what dendrochronology is and why it's a very powerful tool in the environmental sciences. And then I'd like to run through just three very brief uh, case studies to try to illustrate some of the relevance of dendrochronology to uh, environmental science questions today um, and why, where we can have reciprocal relationships with other research communities. So the first thing is, uh, dendrochronology very simply is the study of tree rings, and it provides us with a direct measure of stem growth above ground, and it allows us to relate that, those measurements to multiple different environmental variables. Dendrochronology is a very powerful tool within the environmental sciences arsenal, I would argue. Uh, for one, dendrochronology provides us with very high resolution data on the annual to sub-annual scale. Uh, dendrochronology provides us with uh, measurements over long periods of time, depending on the tree species that you're using, hundreds to thousands of years, and also depending on the forest stand history. Uh, dendrochronology provides a high degree of replication of these uh, it's the uh, object of interest, the, the trees. We can replicate our study within a stand, we can have 20 to 30 trees, and then we can replicate our study across uh, a landscape with multiple sites to answer different types of environmental questions. This also allows us to have a telescopic scale perspective where we can start at stand level, we can move up to a watershed, a region, a hemisphere, and even the globe, depending on the uh, questions that you are asking uh, of the environment. And then finally, tree rings have a multi proxy archive uh, housed within each of these tree rings. Uh, we can extract information from the tree ring widths, from the cells within those tree rings. Uh, we can extract uh, stable carbon and oxygen isotopes out of them, and we can do other measures like blue intensity analysis. And these can be related to multiple different environmental variables that might be of interest to the scientists. But one of the really important things about dendrochronology is it allows us to place current and future changes within a very long-term perspective. And what we have here is um, several tree ring based reconstructions of the Palmer Drought Severity Index for the eastern portion of the United States. And looking at this reconstructed, this 500-year reconstruction, we can see uh, within it many changes within trends and cycles in the Palmer Drought Severity Index. We can see rates magnitude of change within this 500 year long uh, record and we can even see some of the extremes for example let's see right here this is uh, the point of the, uh, the mega drought that happened at the end of the 1500s and affected most of North America including uh, here in New England so we with the tree ring record, we can temporally and spatially exceed the observational record. And that's really important when we need to look backwards in time to see what the changes uh, that are occurring today, what kind of, you know, what is the context of those changes. Now the relevance here is that dendrochronology can address multiple environment questions about the environment that are of interest to forest managers, forest ecologists, to uh, hydrologists, uh, environmental scientists, etc. And there's reciprocal benefits with many other research communities, sharing of data sets, for example, or addressing uh, questions that are of relevance to multiple communities. So what I'm going to do is provide you with three different case studies, and I'm going to run through them very quickly. 
apologize for that. You can ask me questions about this later. The first one has to do with tree rings and stream flow. And what we see here is a reconstruction of stream flow from May through September for what's called the Beaver Kill, which is a river in southern uh, New York. And we used, I think, about 15 different chronologies from about eight different species that are located down in southern New York to do this reconstruction from 1675 up until the year 2000. And what this uh, reveals for us, I'm sorry, we're just looking at the very top uh, reconstruction, don't look at the other two reconstructions, they're not finished yet, um, is it provides us with a long-term perspective. It gives us a much longer perspective than the instrumental record, which only begins in the 20th century, so we're then extending this by several hundreds of years. And it begins to show us periods of uh, both high stream flow and low stream flow, which can be related to climate conditions, high stream flow being related to pluvials, low stream flow being related to drought-like conditions, and again, we're extending this over a longer period of time. The relevance here is that we begin to understand the magnitude, the duration, and the intensity of, for example, a low stream flow or a drought event that can happen here in sort of southern, uh, in the southern New England area, and of course, extreme a drought event would have potential uh, significance for uh, both ecological and societal systems. Uh, it also provides us with a snapshot or a warning, if you will, for the potential for something like this to happen again within uh, our society. Now, reciprocal benefits could be with, um, for instance, USGS, US Geological Survey, uh, stream flow gauge data that's collected by them, and then uh, creating a, a longer record to understand the record of stream flow through the beaver kill, and this would be of interest to water managers who are uh, trying to manage water for large urban areas, for example, or even for agriculture, and this has been shown to be very effective in the western part of the United States. A second way of using tree rings is to look at species and forest productivity. And here we have a reconstruction of sugar maple from the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. And we also have a reconstruction here of red spruce. It's a compilation of multiple sites. Uh, I think it's up to 40 sites uh, from Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. So it's an average of all those sites together. And what we're seeing here first is uh, annual data, again, over a long time period, 60 years, talking about observational data that's reported over and over again here in the tree rings. Um, and we're really looking at trends in productivity in these two particular species. Now, the relevance here is that we can see ahead of time than what we could observe on the landscape that there may be species that are undergoing changes. For instance, sugar maple, where you can see a decrease in uh, the growth of sugar maple in <coughs> Here we go, right through here, so we're getting somewhere in the 1980s and continuing to the present. Or we can see changes, as we've already seen mentioned before, in red spruce where we have an increase in productivity since about 2005. So these declines, these increases can give us an indication possibly of which species are doing well within our forests and maybe give us a clue as to which are going to be the winners and losers in the future uh, in the face of climate change and other changes in our landscape. Reciprocal benefits of this with other research communities are integrating, for instance, forest metrics that are being measured there out in our forests. Uh, in addition, we can integrate with experimental studies as has been very important for the, uh, the uh, red spruce here, uh, understanding what was going on here in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s uh, with acid deposition and the leaching of calcium from the soils, which made these species susceptible to winter injury events, which happened I don't know if I can get the angle here, but over here in 2003. And of course, this would be interesting to managers who are managing their forests for productivity, for carbon sequestration, to have that idea. Right. And then the last one is being able to understand changes in tree physiology through tree rings. And there's still much to be understood about how changing climate and rising atmospheric carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is affecting our northern tree species and gas and water exchange in these species. Now theoretically we know that with rising atmospheric carbon dioxide, photosynthetic uptake and biomass should increase and there should be increased water use efficiency. And water use efficiency is simply the ratio of um, unit of carbon gained for every unit of water lost. We can see we have that here uh, in terms of this one. I'll explain this in just a few minutes. Um, in addition, so with tree rings, what we can do is extract stable carbon isotopes from these, get a time series here, and we can also do a reconstruction of uh, what we call stable carbon isotope discrimination values, and in C3 plants, what that means is that basically those uh, 
plants will preferentially use carbon-12 over carbon-13. Okay, so what does all this mean? What we're looking at here is actually two time series that come from tree rings from uh, eastern hemlock from a site uh, called Abbey Pond down at Middlebury, just outside of Middlebury, Vermont. And what we're looking at is a time series from 1900 to 2010. And if you focus on the period from 1900 to about 1964, represented by the black dots, what we see are two significant linear trends. We see a decrease in stable carbon isotope discrimination, and we see an increase in water use efficiency. So what that means is the stomata are uh, responding, in this case, to rising atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. They're becoming more water use efficient, uh, and they, uh, we return this as an active response. When we look at the blue dots, which go from about 1965 to 1989, we see no trend in the stable isotope uh, discrimination values. We see a, sl a slight upward trend in the uh, intrinsic water use efficiency, which is an indication, again, of an active response. The real interesting part is that last period from 1990 up until 2000, where we actually see a increase in the discrimination, meaning that the stomates are open, but we see no change in water use efficiency. And this has been termed a passive response, meaning that we think that this species has, is no longer responding to increase in carbon dioxide, that it's physiologically lazy now, the stomates are just not responding to that. But the opening of the stomate seems to be linked to the current pluvial we're in. So we have a, a, an increase in, in pluvial conditions. Um, relevance is understanding the vegetation response to the atmosphere and to uh, the hydrosphere, so that's important, and that'll be important in terms of managing our ecosystem services, and I'm out of time. So if you have any questions, we'd be happy to add, answer them later on, and uh, both Paul Schauberg and I would be happy to talk to you about collaborations with uh, dendrochronologists. Thank you.